Hello and welcome to a reading and a review of a book which I've absolutely adored for years. It's called A Time of Gifts by Patrick Lee Fermor. He, at the age of 18, left London and took a night boat to the Hook of Holland and set out with his intention of walking to Constantinople. This is the first of two. The second one is called Between the Woods and the Water. And I implore you to read them, whether you are an armchair traveller or you're an active long distance walker or you just love a good story about one person meeting with and interacting with lots of others and writing down and capturing those adventures. This morning I've taken various sections and I've highlighted them. I've put some little silk ribbon tabs in to share what I want to read to you. But it was very hard to actually decide what do I read, what do I review, and how do I determine one section from another, because everything is so good. This is the only book I've read four times in my life, and I'm giving it away tomorrow to somebody before I do some travelling of my own. Just looking at the back jacket blurb, it says, This is the classic memoir of an enchanted journey across pre-war Europe. And that really does tell us what we're getting into. Here's a, a preface. In 1933, at the age of just 18, Patrick Lee Fermor set off from the heart of London on an epic journey to walk to Constantinople. It was to be a momentous experience and one that would change the course of his life. A Time of Gifts is the rich and sparkling account of his adventures as far as Hungary, after which the second book, Between the Woods and the Water, continues the story to the iron gates that divide the Carpathian and Balkan mountains. So let's start and let me share with you aspects of A Time of Gifts on foot to Constantinople, from the Hook of Holland to the Middle Danube. A splendid afternoon to set out, said one of the friends who was seeing me off, peering at the rain and rolling up the window. The other two agreed. Sheltering under the Curzon Street arch of Shepherd Market, we had found a taxi at last. In Half Moon Street, all collars were up. A thousand glistening umbrellas were tilted over a thousand bowler hats in Piccadilly. The German street shops, distorted by streaming water, had become a submarine arcade. And the clubmen of Pall Mall, with china tea and anchovy toast in mind, were scuttling for sanctuary up the steps of their clubs. Blown askew, the Trafalgar Square fountains twirled like mops, and our taxi, delayed by a horde of Charing Cross commuters reeling and stampeding under a cloudburst, swept into the Strand. The vehicle threaded its way through a flux of traffic. We splashed up Ludgate Hill, and the Dome of St Paul's sank deeper in its pillared shoulders. The driver, as he swerved wetly into Upper Thames Street, leaned back and said, Nice weather for young ducks. A smell of fish was there for a moment, then gone. Enjoining haste, the bells of St Magnus the Martyr and St Dunstan's in the east were tolling the hour. Then sheets of water were rising from our front wheels as the taxi floundered on between the Mint and the Tower of London. Dark complexes of battlements and treetops and turrets dimly assembled on one side. Then, straight ahead, the pinnacles and the metal parabolas of Tower Bridge were looming. We halted on the bridge just short of the first Barbican and the driver indicated a flight of stone steps that descended to Iron Gate Wharf. We were down them in a moment and beyond the cobbles and the bollards with the Dutch trickler beating damply from her poop and a ragged fan of smoke streaming over the river, the Stadthood of Willem rode at anchor. At the end of lengthening fathoms of chain, the swirling tide had lifted her with a sigh almost level with the flagstones. Gleaming in the rain and with full steam up for departure, she floated in the mewing circus of gulls. Haste and weather cut short our farewells and our embraces, and I sped down the gangway, clutching my rucksack and my stick, while the others dashed back to the steps. Four sodden trouser legs and two high heels skipping across the puddles, and up them to the waiting taxi. And half a minute later, there they were, high overhead on the balustrade of the bridge, 
craning and waving from the cast-iron quatrefoils. To shield her hair from the rain, the high heel wearer had a Macintosh over her head like a coal heaver. I was signalling frantically back as the hawsers were cast loose and the gangplank shipped. Then they were gone. The anchor chain clattered through the ports and the vessel turned into the current with a wail of her siren. And that's the beginning of his story, about to cross the English Channel to arrive in Holland. His boat docked on the outskirts of Rotterdam and he started. My spirits already high steadily rose as I walked. I could scarcely believe that I was already there. Alone, that is, on the move, advancing into Europe, surrounded by all this emptiness and change, with a thousand wonders waiting. Because of this, perhaps the actual doings of the next few days emerged from the general glow in a disjointed and haphazard way. I halted at a signpost to eat a hunk of bread with a yellow wedge of cheese sliced from a red cannonball via village grocer. One arm of the signpost pointed to Amsterdam and Utrecht, the other to Dordrecht, Breda and Antwerp, and I obeyed the latter. The way followed a river with too swift a current for ice to form, and brambles and hazel and rushes grew thick along the banks. Leaning over a bridge, I watched a string of barges gliding downstream underneath me in the wake of a stertorous tug bound for Rotterdam, and a little later an island as slender as a weaver's shuttle divided at the current midstream. A floating reed fringe spinney, it looked like. A small castle with a steeply pitched shingle roof and turrets with conical tops emerged romantically from the mesh of the branches. Belfries of a dizzy height were scattered haphazard across the landscape. They were visible for a very long way, and in the late afternoon, I singled one of them out for a landmark and a goal. And he walks for several days crossing the flatlands of Holland and makes steady progress. A few days later, he's reaching the edge of the Netherlands and the border with Germany. It was snowing. A signpost had pointed over the bridge to Arnhem, but I stuck to the south bank and followed the road for the German border. In a little while, it veered away from the river, and after a few miles, I espied two figures in the distance. Short of the frontier, they were the last people I saw in Holland. They turned out to be two nuns of St. Vincent de Paul waiting for a country bus. They were shod in clogs. They had black woolen shawls over their shoulders and their blue stuff habits, caught in the middle, billowed in many pleats. Their boxwood rosaries hung in loops and crucifixes were tucked in their belts like daggers. But their two umbrellas were of no avail. The slanting snow invaded their quaffs and piled up in the wide triangular wings. The officials at the Dutch border handed back my passport, duly stamped, and soon I was crossing the last furlongs of no man's land, with the German frontier post growing nearer through the turning snow. Black, white and red were painted in spirals around the road barrier, and soon I could make out the scarlet flag charged with its white disc and its black swastika. Similar emblems had been flying over the whole of Germany for the last ten months. Beyond it were the snow-laden trees and the first white acres of Westphalia. Nothing remains from that first day in Germany but a confused memory of woods and snow and sparse villages in the dim Westphalian landscape and pale sunbeams dulled by clouds. The first landmark is the town of Goch, which I reached by nightfall. And here, in the little tobacconists, the mist begins to clear. Buying cigarettes went without a hitch, but when the shopkeeper said, Wollen Sie einen Stocknägel? I was at sea. From a neat row of them in a drawer, he picked out a little curved aluminium plaque about an inch long with the view of the town and its name stamped on it in relief. It cost a pfennig, he said. Taking my stick, he inserted a tack in the hole at each end of the little medallion and nailed it on. Every town in Germany has its own, and when I lost the stick a month later, already barnacled with 27 of these plaques, it flashed like a silver wand. The town was hung with National Socialist flags, and the window of an outfitter's shop next door held a display of party equipment. Swastika armbands, daggers for the Hitler youth, blouses for Hitler maidens, and brown shirts for grown-up SA men. Swastika buttonholes were arranged in a pattern which read Heil Hitler, and an androgynous wax dummy with a pearly smile was dressed up in the full uniform of a Sturmabteilungsmann. 
I could identify the faces in some of the photographs on show. The talk of fellow gazers revealed the names of the others. Look, there's Rome, someone said, pointing to the leader of the essay, clasping the hand which was to purge him next June, shaking hands with the Führer. Baldur von Schirach was taking the salute from a parade of Hitlerjugend. Goebbels sat at his desk, and Goering appeared in SA costume, in a white uniform, in voluminous leather shorts, nursing a lion club, in tails and a white tie, and also in a fur collar and plumed hunting hat, aiming a sporting gun. But those of Hitler, as a bareheaded brown shirt, or in a belted Macintosh or a double-breasted uniform and peak cap, or patting the head of a flaxen plaited and gap-toothed little girl offering him a bunch of daisies, outnumbered the others. Ein sehr schöner Mann, a woman said. Her companion agreed with a sigh and added that he had wonderful eyes. Reaching the banks of the River Rhine, Lee Firma goes into a sailor's pub, gets heavily drunk and wakes up the next night already on their ship. The gables of the Rhine Keys were gliding past, and as we gathered speed and sailed under one span of the first bridge, the lamps of Cologne all went on simultaneously. In a flash, the fading city soared out of the dark and expanded in a geometrical infinity of electric bulbs. Diminishing skeletons of yellow dots leapt into being along the banks and joined hands across the flood in a sequence of lamp-strung bridges. Cologne was soon sliding astern, the spires were the last of the city to survive, and as they too began to dwindle, a dark red sun dropped through bars of amber into a vague Arbent land that rolled glimmering away towards the Ardennes. I watched the twilight scene from the bows of the leading barge. The new plaque on my stick commemorated the three Magi. Their bones had been brought back from the crusade by Frederick Barbarossa and the legend of St Ursula and her suite of 11,000 virgins. The barges were carrying a cargo of cement to Karlsruhe, where they were due to take on timber from the Black Forest and sail downstream again, possibly to Holland. The barges were pretty low in the water already. The cement stacks were lashed under tarpaulin, lest a downpour should turn the cargo to stone. Near the stern of the leading barge, the funnel puffed out a rank volume of diesel smoke, and just after this hazard swung the brightly painted and beam-like tiller. It was a brilliant starry night, but very cold, and they, my shipmates, said I would freeze to death on the cement stacks. I had planned to curl up in my sleeping bag and lie gazing at the stars. So I settled in one of the bunks, getting up every now and again to smoke a cigarette with whoever was on duty at the tiller. Each barge had a port and starboard light. When another string of barges came downstream, both flotillas signalled with lanterns and the two long Indian files would slide past each other, rocking for a minute or two in each other's wakes. At one point, we passed a tug trailing nine barges, each of them twice the length of ours, and later on, the bright speck of a steamer twinkled in the distance. It expanded as it advanced until it towered high above us and then dwindled and vanished. Deep quarries were scooped out of the banks between the starlit villages that floated downstream. There was a faint glimmer of towns and villages across the plain. Even travelling against the current, we were moving more slowly than we should. The engineer didn't like the sound of the engine. If it broke down altogether, our little procession would start floating chaotically backwards and downstream. Files of barges were constantly overtaking us. As dawn broke, amid a shaking of heads, we tied up at the quays of Bonn. Arriving in Munich several weeks later, Patrick Liefermer checks into the youth hostel and then goes out to a bar, gets incredibly drunk, wakes up in another house and remembers that all his stuff is still at the youth hostel. When he goes back to the hostel, his rucksack has been stolen and his walking stick with all of those 27 Stocknagel plaques has also disappeared. He asks the hosts that he stayed with that night to ring the British consul. His passport is missing and he knows he needs that to cross the border into Austria. Here's the scene from the police station where he goes to report the loss of his passport. The policeman looked grave and I looked graver still for inside the passport, for fear of losing it or of spending too much, I had folded the canvas envelope with the four new pounds and this left me with three marks and 25 pfennigs in the whole world. 
and my lifeline cut for the next four weeks. Apart from this, I gathered that wandering about Germany without papers was a serious offence. The policeman telephoned the details to the central police station and said, we must go to the British consulate. He was formidable in a great coat and belted sidearms and a black lacquered shako and chin strap. I had visions of being packed home as a distressed British subject or conducted to the frontier as an undesirable alien and felt as though last night's debauch was stamped on my head. I might have been back two years in time, guiltily approaching some dreaded study floor. The clerk at the consulate knew all about it. The Hauptpolizeiamt had telephoned. The consul, seated at a huge desk in a comfortable office under photographs of King George V and Queen Mary, was an austere and scholarly-looking figure in horn rim spectacles. He asked me in a tired voice what was all the fuss about. Perched on the edge of a leather armchair, I told him, and roughly outlined my Constantinople plan and the idea of writing a book. Then, caught up in a fit of volubility, I launched myself on a sort of rambling, prudently censored autobiography. When I finished, he asked me where my father was. In India, I told him. He nodded, and there was a tactful pause. He leant back, with fingertips joined, gazing vaguely at the ceiling, and said, Got a photograph? This rather puzzled me. Of my father? I I'm afraid not. He laughed and said, No, of you. And I realised things were taking a turn for the better. The clerk and the policeman led me round the corner to a photomaton shop, which left me with only a few fennigs. Then I signed the documents waiting in the hall and was summoned back to the consul's office. He asked me what I proposed to use for money. I hadn't thought yet. I said perhaps I could find odd jobs on farms, walking every other day, till I'd let enough time elapse for some more cash to mount up. He said, well, his majesty's government will lend you a fiver. Send it back some time when you're less broke. After my amazed thanks, he asked me how I had come to leave my stuff unguarded in the Jugendherberge. I told him all. The recital evoked another tired smile. When the clerk came in with a passport, the consul general signed and blotted it carefully, took some banknotes from a drawer, placed them between the pages, and pushed it over to my side of the desk. There you are. Try not to lose it this time. I've still got it in front of me now, faded, torn, dog-eared and travel-stained, crammed with the visas of vanished kingdoms and entry and exit stamps in Latin, Greek and Cyrillic characters. The face in the discoloured snap has a dissolute and rather impertinent look. The consular stamp has gratis written across it, and the signature is D. St. Clair Gainer. Imagine losing your passport and being down to your last marks and fennigs and making his way slowly over a several week period to Vienna. He looks upon the burger of a castle in one small village and then proceeds to be recommended by one Castellan family to another a few days or one or two days march hench from their location and he's begins instead of sleeping in barns and crofts and fields we see him recounting his time spent in schloss and beautiful castles across the landscape of austria the libraries of all these castles contained maya's conversation lexicon as soon as i decently could i would beg to be let loose amongst its many volumes with the plea that questions which had cropped up on the road that it was a torment to leave unsolved. This often caused surprise, always pleasure. At the least, it solved the problem of entertainment, and sometimes it started a kindred curiosity, leading to searches in the library through dense columns of Gothic type. Maya was sometimes backed up by the La Russe 20th century or the Encyclopaedia Britannica, once miraculously later in Transylvania, and once again later on in Moldavia, all three were present. Atlases, maps and picture books were loaded into one's arms at bedtime. Shaded paraffin lamps, I think, not electricity, light up a few of these rooms after dark. I'm sure candles lit the music when I turned over for someone at the piano. I can see the glitter of their flames in the removed rings at the end of the keyboard as clearly as I can hear the leader of Schubert and Strauss and Hugo Wolf and their Erkolung last. 
Music played a leading part in all these households. The sounds of practising, wines and long passages, sheet music and bound scores scatter the furniture. The variously shaped instrument cases gathering dust in the attics bear witness to palmier days when the family and its staff and its guests would assemble for symphonies. Now and then the pipes of an organ clutter in the hall and a gilt harp gleams in a corner of the library with all its strings intact. After I had said good night and made my way book laden along an antlered corridor and up a stone spiral to my room, it was hard to believe I had been sleeping in a byre the night before. There is much to recommend moving straight from straw to a four poster and then back again, cocooned in smooth linen and lulled by the smell of logs and beeswax and lavender. I nevertheless stayed awake for hours, revelling in all these delights and contrasting them with joy to the now familiar charms of cowsheds and haylofts and barns. The feeling would still be there when I woke up next morning and I looked down from the window. The last sunrise of January was sliding across a lawn, catching the statues of Vertumnus and Parles and finally Pomona at the far end and stretching their thin and powdery shadows on the untouched snow. Rocky woods feathered the skyline, and there was a feeling in the air that the Danube was not far. The Danube, particularly in this deep gorge, seemed far wilder than the Rhine, and much lonelier. How scarce was the river traffic by comparison? Perhaps the fear of ice jams kept boats at anchor. I could walk for hours now without hearing a siren. At rare intervals a string of barges usually from one of the Balkan kingdoms, would toil upstream with a cargo of wheat. After delivering their freight and loading up with planks or paving stones, they would glide downstream again with the current. These cargoes were quarried and felled from the cliffs. Huge horseshoe cavities were blasted out of the cliffs, and the mountains, from the water's edge to their summits, were a never-ending stand of timber. Deep in snow, the near-perpendicular rides sundered the forests in long white stripes, that were scattered with thousands of felled tree trunks like the contents of spilled matchboxes. Smaller trunks were cut and stacked in clearings and I could hear the sound of the felling and the voices of the woodmen long before I saw them. From the riverside every mile or so rose the zing of a circular saw and the echo of planks falling where cloudy ghosts covered in sawdust were dismembering sledge load after sledge load of forest giants. The only other men in these woods were foresters Loden clad figures in clouted boots who lived among deer and squirrels and badgers and polecats. One of them, every now and then, with a gun in the crook of his arm and ice on his whiskers and his eyebrows and a pipe with a lidded china bowl, would materialise among the trees like a vision of Drac Frost. Sometimes we would keep each other company for a mile or two while Bruegel dogs trotted alertly ahead. There was plenty of game in these mountains. The cloven slots I noticed in the snow were the prints of roe deer, as I had thought, and once or twice I caught brief glimpses of them standing at gaze for a moment, then bounding for cover with a scattering of snow from the low branches. But Styria and the Tyrol, the gamekeepers, all agreed those were the places. I learnt that when a young hunter stalks and lays low his first stag, his jaeger marks the occasion with a sort of woodland blooding that sounds so horribly ancient and redolent of feudal forest law, or the defiance of it, that the little ceremony has stuck in my mind ever since. The jaeger breaks off a branch and strikes the novice three times across the shoulders, quite hard, saying as he does so a line for each swish, eins für den Herren, eins für den Knecht, eins für das Alte, Weidmannsrecht, one for the Lord, one for the serf, and one for the ancient woodsman's rights. When you come out of the forest, says Patrick Lee Fermore, there was always a golden heart or a white rose for bread and cheese among the huddle of roofs, or for a coffee and a himbergist. Often, half in a bay of the mountains and half on a headland, a small and near amphibian schloss mouldered in the failing light among the geese and the elder bushes and the apple trees. Dank walls rose between towers that were topped with cones of molting shingle. Reeds throve in every cranny. Moss mottled the walls. Fissures branched like forked lightning across damp masonry which the rusting iron clamps tried to hold together, and buttresses of brick shored up the perilous leaning walls. 
The mountains, delaying sunrise and hastening dusk, must have halved again these short winter days. Those buildings looked too forlorn for habitation, but in the tiny, creeper-smothered windows, a faint light would show at dusk. Who lived in those stone-flagged rooms where the sun never came, immuted in those six-foot-thick walls, overgrown outside with the conquering ivy and within by genealogical trees, all molting with mildew? My thoughts flew at once to solitary figures, a widowed descendant of a lady-in-waiting at the court of Charlemagne, alone with the sacred heart and her beads, or a family of wax-pale barons recklessly inbred, bachelors with walrus moustaches bent double with rheumatism, shuddering from room to room and coughing amongst their lurches, while their cleft pallets called to each other down corridors that were all but pitch dark. Before we reach the actual end of this book, I just want to read a little section about where Lee Fermer wakes up in a youth hostel in Vienna, where he's arrived without any money, he's run out of funds, and so he seeks the support of the Salvation Army and is directed to a hostel. Here are his diary notes from that very first morning when he wakes. An arresting figure in blue striped pyjamas was sitting up reading in the next bed when I awoke. The fleeting look of Don Quixote in his profile would have been pronounced if his whiskers had been springier, but they drooped instead of jutting. His face was narrow-boned and his silky pale brown hair was in premature retreat from his brow and thin on top. His light blue eyes were of an almost calf-like gentleness. Between the benign curve of his moustache and a well-shaped but receding chin, the lower lip drooped a little, revealing two large front teeth, and his head, poised on a long neck with a prominent Adam's apple, was attached to a tall and gangling frame. No appearance could have tallied more closely with foreign caricatures of a certain kind of Englishman. A mild, rather distinguished benevolence stamped my neighbour. When he saw that I was awake, he said in English, I hope your slumbers were peaceful and mated with quiet dreams. The accent, though unmistakably foreign, was good, but the turn of phrase, puzzling, no trace of facetiousness marred an expression of sincere and gentle concern. His name was Conrad, and he was the son of a pastor in the Frisian Islands. I soon learned that they follow the coasts of Holland and Germany and Denmark in a long, drawn-out archipelago from the Zweide Zee to the Heligoland Blight, where they turn north and die away off the Jutish coast. Tapered by tides and winds, interspersed with reefs, always crumbling and changing shape, littered with wrecks, surrounded by submerged villages, clouded with birds and heavily invaded, some of them by summer bathers, the islands scarcely rise above sea level. Conrad belonged to the German central stretch. He had learnt English at school and had continued his studies during spare time from a multiplicity of jobs, almost exclusively by reading Shakespeare, and this sometimes gave his utterances an incongruous and even archaic turn. Holding up a disintegrating volume, he told me he was rereading Titus Andronicus. When I realised that the book was a complete Shakespeare, I begged for it and turned to Winter's Tale in high excitement. With his new friend Conrad, he spends three or four days in Vienna, waiting for the arrival of another four pounds by post restaurant mail sent by his father from India to arrive. Conrad suggests that because Lee Fermor can do a decent sketch, and they start a process which lasts them through several days of Lee Fermor tapping on the doors of apartment units, whilst Conrad keeps guard or sits on a bench outside the block in case somebody doesn't want them to be on the premises. Lee Fermer is initially very scared or nervous about the idea of such door knocking and offering to sketch. But Conrad is fairly firm with him. I gave in and soon I began to feel rather excited. Before we left, I thought of lighting a candle to bring us luck, but we hadn't a single coin between us. We headed for the Maria Hilf quarter. Falling into step with me, Conrad said, we will commence with the small buggers. To my surprise, for his usual discourse was rather prim, I asked him, what small buggers? 
He stopped dead and a blush began to spread until it had entirely mantled his long face. Oh, dear young, he cried. I am sorry. Ich meinte, wir würden mich Kleinbürgern erfangen. With little burghers, the rich and the noble here, he waved his hand around the old city, have always lackeys, many and proud, and sometimes they are not deigning to vouchsafe. As we walked, he rehearsed me in what to say. He thought I should ask for five shillings a picture. I said that was too much. I would ask for two, a bit more than an English shilling, in fact. Why didn't he keep me company for the first few times? Ah, dear young, he said, I am ripe of years already. I would be always frightening them. You, so tender, will melt hearts. He told me that Viennese front doors were pierced with peepholes at eye level, through which the inhabitants always surveyed prospective visitors before they unlatched. Never cast your eye on it, he advised me. Ring and then gaze upward at the everlasting with innocence and soul. He took my walking stick and advised me to carry my coat folded over one arm and hold my sketching book and pencil in the other hand. My outfit looked a little odd, but it was still clean and tidy, boots, putties, cord breeches, leather jerkin, and a grey shirt and pale blue handwoven and rather artistic tie. I combed my hair in a shop window, and the closer we got to our field of action, the more I felt we must have resembled Fagin and the artful Dodger. We shook hands earnestly in the hall of an old-fashioned block of flats, and I mounted and rang the bell on the mezzanine floor. The first calling is an absolute disaster. He's mistaken for an unwanted nephew of a household, and actually the man of the house comes out and pushes Lee Fermor across the public hallway of the apartment block. Then, realising the mistaken identity, his wife shouts at the householder to bring the son back, to bring Lee Fermor back in. All is good, he's handsomely rewarded, and then he's passed from flat to flat within the block and makes a fair few shillings in the course of the day. The sketch didn't seem very good to me, but when it was finished, my sitter was delighted. He sprang to his feet and flew buoyantly about the room with the sketch at arm's length, the forefinger and thumb of the other hand joined in connoisseurship. Ein chef d'oeuvre, he said, ein wirkliches Meisterstück. They declared themselves astonished at the low fee demanded. I graciously accepted a handful of cigars as well, and then I did a sketch of his wife. He persisted as she sat in using the bun on the crown of her head as a pivot for swivelling her face to more telling angles. And when this was finished, they led me across the landing to do a sketch of a retired lady singer, who in turn passed me on to the wife of a music publisher. I was launched. When I found Conrad again, he was patiently mooning about the pavement. I approached him as though I had just slain the Jabberwock and was suitably acclaimed. In a few minutes we were in a schnug Gastzimmer, toying with Krenwurst, ordered delicious Jungfernbraten, and Gerüstet potatoes and wine. Thanks to the Major from the Salvation Army Hostel, Conrad and my recent sitters, body and soul, had been kept firmly together. But it was the first actual meal since dinner at the castle two days earlier. It seemed a long time ago. For Conrad, I think, it was the first real spread for much longer. A little flustered at first, he professed to deplore all this extravagance. My attitude from a phrase in the winter's tale which we had been looking at earlier was, "'Tis fairy gold, boy, and twill prove so. And as we clinked glasses, my elation affected him. You see, dear young, how boldness is always prospering. After this feast, I went back to work, leaving Conrad in a cafe reading Venus and Adonis. This is just a snippet from a tremendous book that I absolutely encourage and endorse and suggest you read if you like any aspect of the lonesome traveller moving through a landscape and encountering the people with whom he will fill his diary and share such abject suffering and then the extravagances of things when they turn out well. That's my take on A Time of Gifts by Patrick Lee Fermore. When I was 16, I left with a friend called Charlie and we left Nottinghamshire. We hitchhiked, because in those days that was an easy thing to do, down to the coast at Dover, jumped on a passenger ferry without paying because we each got a lift in a different um, lorry cab, went across to Calais and then we hitchhiked 
a similar route without knowing anything about the book at that stage. I didn't read that book until the fir- for the first time until I was 21. But I've, I've had many copies and I've given many copies away. But we hitchhiked around Holland and Belgium, down through Germany and into Austria. And we also ended up in Vienna after about three and a half weeks. Patrick Lee Fermor travelled on four or five pounds a month when we were hitchhiking. I remember that we were very proud that 15 pounds was enough for what ended as five weeks travelling around Europe and I still came home with a fiver after the 15 pounds that my father had advanced me as a gift for the trip. But we had amazing adventures and the whole benefit of travelling as a young person is that it gives you so much enrichment through those experiences. It's a book I've dipped into countless times just to remind myself of the pleasure of travelling and the joy of being hosted by strangers. When I walked across Mexico in 1984 from the Pacific Ocean to the Caribbean coast, I too experienced that tremendous generosity of spirit and the opening of doors to a solo traveller in a new landscape, whether it be in beach colonies or mountain hamlets or in jungle villages. And also, and always the confidence that I carried with me, you know, my rucksack and my hammock and a machete, there was a ghost of Patrick Lee Fermor pushing me forward when things were difficult and also allowing me to express with sheer delight my gratitude to strangers becoming friends in these small hamlets. If you've enjoyed just some of the sharing that I've done today from this tremendous book, I'll put a link to it in the description. It's called A Time of Gifts and I will again put my name and date of this most recent reading. I finished it last week again um, and I'm going to share it and give it to a friend as a gift to him because he's been travelling recently in Eastern Europe and is just back. So we're going to meet for coffee, and this will be my gift to him, A Time of Gifts by Patrick Lee Fermore.